Um, that was really, it, it was great. The, the response on the chat lines was fantastic. You'll be pleased to know that lots of people were watching from the UK. Oh, that's someone lovely. Someone from Iran. Yes, that's my family. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. It was fantastic. And uh, in fact, you might need to persuade people that you actually are here in Australia because there are a couple of people who are saying, no, no, she's in England. But, all uh, right, so. all right. Well, my family, uh, I am from the UK. My family live in the UK. I try and get um, back as much as I possibly can, but I am currently based in Melbourne, correct? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so she's ours for the moment, anyway. <laughs> um, are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Okay, so question one is from Lauren, which is, uh, how does performing in a venue like this compare to a concert hall? That's a really good question. Um, well, I mean, technically, this, this would have been used for concerts. There would have been audiences here. I mean, the only difference really is that there is no audience. The hall is the same. Um, and it kind of feels a little bit, I guess, like playing on radio. Um, although I've got to say, um, preparation was really different. So if I'm preparing for a concert, no matter if it's radio or just a normal concert with audience, I really like to have as many test runs as possible. I'd like to just um, go out to friends' houses and just get a bunch of people, just play it through many times. Obviously, with the COVID-19 situation, that was almost impossible. I mean, as restrictions started to ease, I was able to just play through to one or two people at a time. And um, you know who you are out there. Thank you so much. Um, lots and lots of love to you. And um, so thank you for all your support. Um, but yes, in that sense, it was, it was quite different with the preparation. Cool. Uh, question number two from Katie. Do you feel the absence of an audience affects your performance style? There you go, good follow on from the previous yeah. question. So. <laughs> yeah, another good, um, interesting question. Um, I mean, it, it, does feel, it does feel different. So in my head, because it, I mean, apart from it being um, a different venue, it kind of feels like just practicing in my, in my music room at home. Um, and I was kind of a little bit worried in case, what, I, what if I forget that I'm actually on air and I just think, oh no, I'll just do that bit again. So <laughs> um, it's kind of a different mindset, I would say. That's great. Uh, we have another question. Uh, oh, here you go. Um, Abhishek asks, as an artist, would you consider performing live as the new norm in the industry? I'm guessing that Abhishek means performing like live streaming? Oh, yeah. Do you think? Probably, kind of, yeah. yeah. I'll answer it as Interesting if. Interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this is a really great way of performing, um, I guess, to audiences that can't be here. So as, um, as Tom said, that um, I've got people in the UK and Iran that obviously, if, even if this was a live, um, like a regular concert, I guess, those sorts of people wouldn't be here. So I think it's really um, a really nice thing to, to continue if possible. And I think that it would be, um, um, I think that it can only go from strength to strength, to be honest, this sort of, I don't think that it should replace audiences because that is um, a very special way of performing. Um, and um, there's that connection. So in this sort of situation, there isn't that sort of connection you can bounce off, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, so it's different, but absolutely. <laughs> Great. I'm actually going to sneakily ask a question of my own, if that's all right. Absolutely. Sorry, viewers, we'll get to your question <laughs> very soon. Um, but I, I was just wondering, I, when I was listening to Chopin, I, I kind of, I, I was thinking about the composer, and mm. I was just wondering whether when you are performing that music, whether you do have a sense of the presence of the composer and some kind of communication with them. Mm. So I've, I try to, um, well, with the preludes, for instance, um, I just try to get to know them as much as possible, what the composer was doing, where he was, um, where he was writing them, what was going on in, in his life at the time. Um, and I know that, um, I mean, actually, I'm going to be honest, this has been a really big project for me. Um, so I've kind of um, took a few at a time and then put them away, then other things brought them back. So, um, yeah, it, it, um, it was a big project. But um, in answer to your question, yeah, I do try and feel a, a connection with the composer, absolutely. Great. It shows. <laughs> um, uh, this is a question from Christina Wilkes, who is listening live from Bognor Regis in Aww. the UK. <laughs> Which composer do you think poses the biggest challenge to a pianist and why? Another really interesting question. These are great questions. Um, I think it depends on the pianist, 
I mean, f for instance, um, I don't have particularly big hands, so and I'm 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 not. I mean, I try to be strong, but I, I guess I'm not the strongest person out there by any means. So I mean, um, there are certain composers which I personally um, wouldn't play. I mean, I might just um, practice them for my own development, but I may not necessarily perform them. Um, so I think it's it's really individual um, to each pianist. Mm, I, I have to say, from that performance, I think you're pretty strong. I was oh, kind of very glad you got the sense of power there. It was oh, wonderful. Good. <laughs> um, Lake Bear 123 asks us, do your moods change when you play different pieces? Um, I would say rather than the pieces making them change, I first have to change my mood in order to play the piece. Um, so I guess it's um, a little bit like um, being an actor. So I try and get into that role, so to speak, and then, um, and then go into that piece. So with the preludes, obviously the 24, um, it, it has to change very rapidly, which is something that I was um, working on quite a bit. Yeah, it was really extraordinary. There were lots of comments about that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Um, a question from Frank McIndoo. What, if anything, do you miss about an audience? Not the coughing, I assume, he <laughs> Oh Well, that kind of ties into um, one of the previous questions. So I was mentioning, I think, that when you've got an audience, you can kind of feel that connection and you kind of bounce off the atmosphere. Um, from the composer to the performer to the audience. So with that not being there, I, I think, well, I felt, I can only speak, speak for myself, but I felt a lot more um, kind of um, consumed with just what I was doing, um, which is a good thing as well, I suppose, but mm. it, it is different. <laughs> yeah. Um, do we have a question seven? I might have missed the last question thing. I think that may have been the last question because it's not moving. I'm sorry, I think I missed a cue in there. Oh, that's OK. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yasmin. That was really extraordinary. Thank you really so much wonderful. for having me. I've had the best evening and I hope everyone else enjoyed it too. Thank you for having me and live. <laughs> So thank you. That's all we have time for tonight. Uh, again, thank you to, for an exhilarating performance from Yasmin Rowe. Thank you also to the backstage crew. There are extraordinary people out there controlling the lighting, the sound and the cameras. Uh, and of course, thank you to all of you watching tonight. We really appreciate you being here for the M Live Sound Gallery sessions. And we really hope that you will be tuning in to the first concert of our next series, in a, a couple of weeks' time. So good night. We would like to thank you and everyone involved in this experience. For more on the Sound Gallery sessions, visit monash.edu forward slash mlive.